Today we're going to be talking about, I'm trying to get rid of that little menu on there, uh, the, the new intervening building code that will be coming out. Uh, it's actually in print now, but it won't be taking effect until July of later this year. So you have time to review it and see what the implications are. But we're going to go over uh, the basics of it. Um, some of the items I'll go over pretty quickly because there's a lot of pointer changes or uh, just corrections of wording and uh, shouldn't take a whole lot at that point. Okay. So let's get, go ahead and get started. So to, this is a two-part series. Uh, today we're gonna be covering part one, the administrative code, as well as part two, the building code uh, for both volume one and volume two, which will be the non-structural and the planning, as well as uh, volume two, the structural. And we have Roy Lobo with us today as well for that portion. And then we'll, in February, we're doing the electrical, mechanical, and plumbing code, as well as the existing building code. So uh, kind of some basics today. Uh, we tried to color coordinate what's changing. So um, bold text or regular black text is, text is existing and there's no change. Um, underlying blue text is what we're adding to the code. And if it's, if it's underlying blue with a red uh, wording there, that's just for emphasis. Um, and also, if it's gray and struck out, that's the old language, sometimes useful to see what it used to say. And any purple text is just re for reference. Um, we might be talking about something and pulling a definition. So that's just for reference only. Okay. So let's start with part one, administrative code. And there's a little bit of a lag on here, so just bear with us on the change of the slides. Um, first thing we're looking at is the requirements for uh, SPC. Um, what we're doing is removing the language um, for submitting an, ex an application for an extension because that date has expired as, as of January 1st, 2020. And so just the wording has changed so that if it was in progress, this is what you do. So it's just a, it's really a change in tense here. Uh, we've added some definitions. We're gonna go over those. We added emergency repair, which is a repair to or replacement of an element of a building structure, utility system or equipment that is essential to the continued safe operation and operation occupation and operation of a facility. It may include repairs needed after disaster. Uh, this is gonna be used when, if there is something you consider an emergency repair, you would contact the regional compliance officer or RCO or the compliance officer and let them know you have an emergency repair and they can authorize that to be done. We also added, um, try to clarify the definition for a hospital building. Um, and it, if it's freestanding, it used to be if uh, a building is separated from a hospital building, now it's just a freestanding building. And if you remember from the 1R presentations, a freestanding building is physically not connected to the hospital. It is separated, as it said before, but it, there's going to be a lot more uh, use of the word freestanding in this code with some of the definitions. So that's why we revised that. And this is really to accommodate some of the 1R implications as well as jurisdictional um, effects of a freestanding building. Uh, other definitions we added was maintenance. We talked about emergency repair. Now, maintenance is the routinely recurring work required to keep a facility in such condition that it may be continuously utilized at its original design capacity and efficiency for intended for its intended purpose. Actions necessary for retaining or restoring an existing element of a component or building um, or a specific operation operable condition to achieve its maximum useful life, including corrective maintenance and preventative maintenance. So basically um, you can do uh, repairs to your facility um, 
under the maintenance requirement. And again, this falls into some of the definitions of when you need a definitions of when you need a permit. Um, substantial compliance is a term you might have heard uh, Ashpad using over the last year or two. Uh, it's basically very similar to a certificate of occupancy or substantial completion. Uh, substantial completion actually has a different legal term and is used in a different context. So we've added the definition of substantial compliance to show that a, a stage of construction of a building or project or designated portion of the project that is sufficiently complete in accordance with the approved construction plans and the California Building Standards Code that the owner may occupy the building for his designated uh, and intended purpose. So this is, allows for partial occupancies as well as complete occupancies. Now, the difference between a substantial compliance and a certificate of occupancy is if you have a brand new building that's never been occupied, or if you're changing the occupancy of a building or a project or an area department, um, that would be a certificate of occupancy. If you're just doing an alteration to the building, it would be a substantial compliance. Okay, moving on. Um, this is basically adding some language that says you can submit plans electronically. Um, before it talked about plans having to be a certain size and weight. Um, and just saying that these can also be submitted electronically. The Building Energy Efficiency Program, as you know, started with the 2019 Building Code. And we had a bunch of requirements in there for HVAC systems, indoor lighting, water heating, and building envelope. And um, it actually really doesn't even apply to alterations. So what we're doing instead is we're just pointing over to the energy code and um, we have to comply with the requirements that they provide because this did conflict with what was in the energy code. So we're just making that clarification and pointing back to what are the requirements of the energy code. And under the energy code, the alterations for healthcare facility, licensed healthcare facilities are exempt. Uh, this is new language we're adding. If you're doing plan review and you have changes in the scope, um, changes in the scope during plan review, after the plan review has already been started, shall be, re be required to be submitted as a separate project. That's actually always been the case. It's just never been stated clearly. Um, but what we're doing is adding an exception that at the discretion of the office, which is OSHPOD, um, changes in the scope may be allowed to the original project, but it'll be done as an examination. And basically it's time and materials for, for that review. We get a lot of projects that they change the whole scope. We've already did most of the review um, and we have to go back, redo it all over again. So that will be a time and material change. I just adding some language here for fees. If you do a preliminary review, that fee is not refund is non-refundable. Um, the work for that review has already been completed, and the effort has already been expended, so the fee cannot be refunded. And that is still 10% of the original or the total fee, but it, and it is still um, deducted from the final fee. But if that effort is made. The, that portion of the fee, that 10% is non-refundable. If you're doing a phased submittal review or a collaborative review, a 10% fee is required up front for those types of reviews. That also will be non-refundable because the effort has already been made. If the project is canceled, the effort and the review has already started. Uh, Oshpot has already put a lot of time into these projects. And if the project is canceled, that fee was is to cover our costs. And same with the collaborative review, it's a 1.9% uh, fee for that. That again, just 10%. These are phase plan review and collaborative review. This is just the difference in the uh, percentage and the 10% uh, is non-refundable.
if you are requesting a refund, uh, we are actually changing one that occurs, so the owners can actually get their refund earlier. It previously used to state there's one year from the date the project is closed. Uh, if you've done much uh, hospital work, you know that may get stretched out quite a ways. So now it is one year from the date of certificate of occupancy or certificate of substantial compliance um, issue date. So that again, it brings that date that the owner can get the refund a lot closer. And we're just changing some uh, grammatical stuff here as well. Uh, this section is similar to what we said during plan review. If you make major scope changes, um, that has to be submitted as a new project. This is for ACDs um, or amended construction documents. If there is a, a major scope change in an AC, as coming in as an ACD, that's going to substantially change the scope of the project. It will be required to be submitted as a separate project. Uh, again, this is. Um, old code, code language that was already there, but what we're basically doing rather, we're giving the option, us the option of reviewing that as an ACD, but it will be uh, done as a time and material uh, examination type project. Uh, um, for the IOR class B, uh, uh, inspector exam. There's just some clarification on the requirements that are needed to meet the, the minimum qualifications to be a class B inspector. And that's basically adding the high school graduation or equivalent, uh, two years experience involving uh, building types of type one or two construction as an architect's engineers, owners, local building official or general contractors representative in technical inspection or major or non major structural non structural system of components of the building and possession of the valid certificate of all the following categories and those change have not changed basically it's adding this two year experience in the high school graduation that was mistakenly left off previously so that's it for part 1 we're going to jump over to part 2 the, the building code and we are going to cover uh, volumes 1 and 2 today So at the very beginning, um, we're just uh, changing the application of an OSHPOD 1 building or a 1R building uh, to include, it used to say non-conforming hospital building, we're including a non-conforming hospital SBC or freestanding. And this is the reason we added that freestanding definition, because a hospital building can be a freestanding building if it's uh, removed from acute care service and stays under OSHPOD jurisdiction for any reason. So we're just clarifying that definition. Shouldn't affect too many of you. Um, for earthquake monitoring uh, instruments, this is just something that uh, we're adding some language here that the maintenance and service of the instrument shall be in accordance with Appendix L of Part 2, Volume 2 of the Building Code. Um, just clarifying the language there. Sorry, we have a little bit of a lag in these changing, so I apologize for that. Okay, um, under definitions here, let me back up one. That's what always happens. You hit it twice and it doesn't do it and then jumps two ahead. Um, right now under the equipment definition of fixed equipment, movable and mobile equipment, um, OSHPOD had a banner. We are removing the banner from this. This would apply to OSHPOD 3 buildings and anything that's non-OSHPOD. Um, but what we are doing is adding new definitions that are very similar but expanded on for equipment. And this is applied to the OSHPOD 1, 2, 4, and 5. Um, note that it does not apply to a 1R or an OSHPOD 3 um, building. And basically, what we're adding is different types of equipment to help really clarify 
the requirements of when anchorage is required and what type of anchorage is required and what needs to be shown on the drawings. So first we have countertop equipment, which is equipment that typically remains on a countertop workbench shelf or support other than floor during its service life. This can or may or may not be fixed to that countertop and that'll be covered later. Um, essential equipment means equipment that the failure of which will significantly impair the operations during or after a disaster. The facility needs to identify which equipment is essential when they're doing the project. In, in addition to that, if they basically say nothing's essential, anything that's required to support the eight basic services of a hospital also are con by default considered essential. A fixed Equipment means equipment that is directly attached to the building or directly connected to a service distribution system utility. Um, interim equipment means that it is used greater than 180 days during construction. Um, as you might be familiar with the temporary equipment being under 180 days. So interim, it's, we get a lot of comments that we have to finish to build out a full central plant because they can't use the generator longer than 180 days and that's not the case um, it just becomes interim and the anchorage is a little is based on the building code and you don't take the um, the benefits of the temporary can <clears throat> mobile equipment means equipment with or without wheels or rollers that is typically used in a different location than where it was than where it is stored and moved from one location in the building to another during ordinary use. The key word here is ordinary use. Um, if it's moving around um, like a wow, a workstation on wheels or something like that is considered mobile equipment. In addition to that, we have movable equipment, which is equipment that is directly attached to a building and or directly connected to a service distribution system or utility with or without wheels, it may have wheels on it, that is typically remains in one fixed location during its service life or use, but is required to be periodically moved to facilitate, facilitate cleaning or maintenance. This would be like a Pixis machine. They're on wheels, they're secured uh, to, the, to an area, but they do have to be unsecured and moved out of the way for cleaning and then put back in its original place. Other equipment means equipment that is not directly connected to a building service distribution system that may or may not have wheels and is typically used at a single location during its service life. Uh, the key here is it's not directly connected to a building service or distribution. So it can be plugged in with like a 110 outlet, but it can't be hardwired or um, otherwise hard, um, hard connected for, with utilities. Temporary equipment, as I mentioned, uh, means fixed, movable, or countertop or other equipment that is used during replacement, maintenance, or repair for a time of service as defined in Section 108. We also did a uh, have a new pin, pin 68, that addresses all of these items and shows you all the anchorage requirements for them. Um, there is a webinar that we did a couple months ago on that and it is available, uh, the video is available to watch that if you want more information on these types of equipment and their anchorage. Um, we're just showing you what's changed in the code and kind of defining what these are, but as far as looking at the actual anchorage, I would recommend you review pin 68 or go back and look at the video that we have on our webinar page on our Oshpod website. Okay, um, for the definition of a hand washing fixture, it's uh, been clarified that it's a lavatory, which is a difference between a lavatory and a sink. The lavatory is what you use for washing your hands or your face. A sink is for pots or pans or other type of utensils. Um, the lavatory provided in patient rooms, nurse stations, or other patient care areas intended for staff hygiene and infection control. Uh, the, these are special use lavatories and are an element of a hand-washing station. And we'll have a revised definition for hand-washing station as well. Um, and is subject to the requirements of the plumbing code. Um, so a, basically a hand-washing fixture is also intended to be uh, accessible. 
Uh, restricted areas, we removed one R. Um, just to, for clarification, um, one R is a type, a building type. When a building is removed from acute care service, it becomes a one R. The OSHPOD one, two, three, four, and five are actually based on the occupants that are within the building. So that's why one R really doesn't apply to things like such as restricted areas or equipment anchorage, because those requirements are based on the occupancy, not the building type. So you'll see a lot of corrections with one R throughout this. Uh, minimum ceiling heights. Um, again, we removed one R from that because ceiling heights are based on occupancy, not the building type, as well as the finished materials in a building. Again, they're going to be based on the occupancy. Uh, we also removed OSHPOD 1R from the hospital banner because it's no longer a hospital once it becomes 1R. Uh, another important change, I think, is the definition of uh, change in function. It used to be satisfied the functional space requirements under a different code. Um, and we remove the word space because what a change in function, what we want required is that the functional requirements be met if there's a change in function, not the space requirements. So in theory, you can have a patient room that's still a patient room for a different type of occupant, peds to adult or something. And the space shouldn't matter. The size of it does not need to be changed, but the functional requirements still need to be met. Still under definitions, we're going to hand washing station is basically a clinical staff use area. It provides hand washing fixture, cleaning agents, and means for drying hands. So basically, a station has the sink the, or the lav, the uh, cleaning soap, and the paper towels, whatever, the whole unit is considered a station. Uh, hand washing stations will be immediately accessible to the patient care area they serve without requiring passage through a doorway unless hands-free operation is provided. Uh, you'll see this a lot with uh, nourishment uh, rooms or nourishment areas. Either one's required, but if you have a door, you need two sinks in that nourishment room. If it is open in the corridor and there's a hand washing fixture outside of that, uh, nourishment area, you only need the one utility sink inside the nourishment area. Uh, patient care locations has been defined a little, actually been defined, period. Uh, multiple multi-patient treatment rooms where allowed may provide patient care stations in bays or cubicles as follows. Um, a bay is a space for human occupancy with one hard wall at the head wall and up to one hard wall at either side with two or three soft walls. Uh, the reason this weird language is being added because we have one hard wall and if you have a bed or a gurney at the end of a row and you happen to have a side wall and a head wall, um, that doesn't make it not a patient bay anymore. It's still part of the bay. Um, but it didn't meet the requirement of only one wall at the head. Uh, so we did add this language because we do get those comments all the time. Um, so that will help clarify this. The required area for specific patient care space shall be provided within the cubicle curtain and not overlap with, the ac with access circulation aisles. So if there is a required access aisle outside the cubicle curtain, that, cub that space cannot overlap with that. So if you have three feet at the sides of the bed, that's where your cubicle curtain will be. A cubicle remain the same. It's basically you have three walls and an open area at the foot of the bed. Then patient care station remains the same, and this is just basically where you have a bed for patient care. And we just added some language that a patient bedroom um, may be a patient room or a patient bedroom. Um, they both terms are used throughout the building code.
Uh, Corridor West for outpatient services, uh, we're just pointing you back to uh, Section 1020.2 for the different widths of corridors and outpatients rather than addressing them in 1224 for outpatient services of a hospital. Uh, the same with supply in, in sec Section 1020. So there's no need to add it, add more here, add more confusion. Uh, ceiling heights. Um, if you have a soffit, um, our ceiling heights in hospitals are eight feet. If you have a, the exception for that is closets, toilet rooms, and bathroom ceiling heights. We're also adding soffits over fixed cabinets or workstations. This is like if you have a nurse station, you want to drop the soffit down over the nurse station to seven feet, that would be allowed. So that, this adds some clarity to that. Um, Grab bars for non-accessible patient rooms. All patient rooms have to have grab bars, but if you have a non-accessible patient rooms, it also has to be have a grab bar, and we're clarifying that it has to meet the uh, section 609, two, three, five, six, and eight, which are listed here in purple for reference. Basically, we're eliminating the need that that grab bar be horizontal. Um, as you can see in the picture, this is where you can have the angled or even vertical type uh, grab bars in a non-accessible accessible patient room. Um, for uh, This is allowing for CT rooms that you can have a control room or an alcove. Um, this is, would be considered an alcove. You have no door separating the tech area from the service area. So that added some confusion where people were interpreting that as a door being required. And that is not the case for CT. We also changed the um, word convenient. We've been trying to get rid of that word. We're making the toilet room for a CT readily accessible which means located in the same department or service space as the identified area room or located in and shared with an adjacent directly accessible unit. So that makes it this a lot easier requirement to be met for CT scanners. I get two clicks here. Caesar, can you forward it? Oh, there it goes. Okay, uh, storage. Uh, basically, this, all this is saying is that storage um, that's in excess of what's required by the building code in 1224 can be located in a 1R building or a non-conforming building, um, but it has to be in excess of what's actually required for basic services. For NICU, we made some clarifications. Um, before, it pointed us back to 1224.19, um, which or 29, excuse me, for ICU. Um, and so we had this requirement that NICUs had all the requirements and uh, ICU. I'm not sure what's going on here. This thing's jumping around on me. I apologize. Um, a NICU had all the requirements of a ICU, which is not the intent. I'm trying to, if I hit this too many times, it jumps too far, so bear with me. Um, so what we're adding here is changing the language to um, for requirements for a NICU bed to be specific to the NICU and not point back to the ICU as much. And this would be um, one of the requirements here is if you have uh, multi-bay NICU beds, um, like a pod of five beds, you must still provide a, you must also provide a treatment room for private treatment of the baby or the patient. Um, in addition to that, I'm going by memory here because this thing's not moving very fast. 
The, it also pointed back and required a nourishment area. A NICU does not require a nourishment area. It does require infant formula area. So the nourishment area has, has been eliminated as a requirement. It still points back by saying nourishment area is not required under this for a NICU. Uh, for emergency departments, um, in a trauma slash cardiac room that is required for a basic service emergency medical emergency department, um, if there's always been this requirement that scrub sinks be required at the entrance to the trauma rooms, um, a lot of facilities want to put hand washing stations inside because these can potentially be used as operating rooms. Um, under emergency conditions that there is some controversy if the hand washing station would be allowed. And conferring with uh, CDPH on this, it is allowed, but it needs to be five feet away from the procedure table because that is the area that's most restrictive. So if there's a hand wash sink, like in this case, it's in the back here, um, needs to be five feet clear from the procedure table and not located between the curtains um, if the bay is se separate, separated into two areas with a cubicle curtain, it has to be accessible from both bays. So it can't be contained in any one bay or it needs to be in both if you're going to go that route. For in emergency rooms, uh, the there was a requirement there is a requirement in Title 22 that there is um, a medication preparation room. Um, that language was removed from the code a couple cycles ago and has, has, wasn't really an issue because a lot of emergency departments do include uh, med rooms. Um, but we have had circumstance where the med rooms were not included and when the CDPH went out to survey to open the unit, they're looking for the med room. Um, so we've added the language back in to match Title 22 that a med room shall be provided in accordance with 1224.4.4.4.1, which is the med room requirement. Um, just as a note, the emergency departments are required to have at least one med room, and then they can have PIXIS or OmniCell type uh, medical dispensing units uh, throughout. But they need to have at least a minimum of one med prep room for security purposes. For Nuke Med, uh, we, we receive a lot of um, AMCs, alternate methods of compliance requests to remove the dosing and the holding areas for patients because they, they're stating that they're not giving the, these patients any radioactive type uh, doses that there's no need for them to be secured or monitored from other patients. Um, so we're adding uh, an allowance here that the physicist's report shall address any dosing or circulation of dosed patients um, in the nuclear med department, and that will better allow for their elimination of the holding and uh, dosing areas in these rooms. Um, we also added that if there's multi-bay scanner rooms, a minimum clear for, clearance of four feet shall be provided between the scanner and any mobile screen used between uh, bays. And we removed the requirement for full direct view of the patient. You still must have full view. Um, there was just some uh, confusion on if that meant looking down the bore of the equipment, and it does not. You just need to be able to see the patient when they're on the imaging equipment. Um, there was a lot of confusion with the support areas for nuclear med. Uh, it used to say when operated separately from an image department, you have to provide the following. But if it was, and that's where your dosing area and your holding area came in. But if it, people were putting it as part of an imaging department, they said, we don't need that dosing area and we don't need that holding area. And the reality is you may, depending on the type of procedures going in. So this allows with the 
top item here for dosing and circulation. This allows for the removal of those areas if they're not needed, but also makes it clear that if nuclear medicine is providing within the imaging department, compatible areas may be shared with the other modalities. But you still need that dosing area and the holding patient holding area for nu nuclear med if there's any type of um, the higher radiation doses are being administered. So hopefully I add some clarification on that in the future because it was worded poorly. Rehab therapy departments. When you look at rehab therapy, you have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and uh, audio and uh, speech pathology um, services. When two or more of these services are provided, they can be shared. That wasn't clear before. And a lot of times it was required to have a separate physical therapy department. Occupational therapy uh, has, has separate units or separate little departments. And that is not the case. They can be shared. They can share the space. They can share the toilet um, that between them. Um, so this will, again, help add some clarification to that. And also, we made it clear that a lot of uh, rehab hospitals do not have outpatient services, but it was always required that a outpatient, um, an exam room needed to be provided as well as an, out, um, an office for an outpatient physician. Um, now it says if outpatient rehab services are provided, then you have to require that waiting room and that uh, exam room and office. Okay, the only requirement is that outpatients shall not traverse an inpatient nursing unit. For uh, renal dialysis, we're just adding the requirement for a med station. And that can be either a med prep room or a self-dispense uh, medication dispensing unit. Uh, outpatient services for GI endoscopy rooms, uh, just to align with uh, FGI standards, we added the requirement for an eyewash station. Um, I think each cycle we do, we try to get more in alignment with what the FGI is doing. Um, for now, we're jumping over to skilled nursing. We're already done with hospitals. Uh, skilled nursing facilities, inter intermediate care facilities must have a uh, toilet room attached to each patient room. Uh, outpatient clinical services of a hospital. Uh, we're just, again, just changing the language to be a little more standard um, for, for consideration of a freestanding building that is outpatient, can still be a licensed uh, service of the hospital. Uh, just referring you back to the administrative code, section 111, and also uh, the part 10 is the existing building code is that section 309A.5.1 basically covers what to do when you're changing a building to it from removing acute care services and um, want to keep it under the jurisdiction of Ashpat. Um, continuing with that, um, outpatient clinical services of hospital provided in a freestanding building are regulated as OSHPOD 3 and not OSHPOD 1. Again, the acute care services most likely have been removed from that building. That's why it is a freestanding building now, um, outpatient building, and it goes by the occupancy, and the occupancy should be OSHPOD 3 at this point. And then the, the services will comply with 1226, which is your clinical requirements. Um, outpatient clinical services of a hospital that are addressed in provisions 1226 shall comply with the applicable provisions of 1224 and or 1228 as if those provisions were repeated in 1226.5. Um, so basically, they're, they're trying to better align the requirements for different departments, no matter if it's outpatient, 
or a hospital service or a clinic. Uh, GI endoscopy, uh, there, this is just being removed. It was redundant. Uh, it aligned. There's already a requirement for a soil utility room, so we removed the cleanup room. Jumping over to 1228 for psychiatric units, uh, we are clarifying that for airborne isolation rooms, bedpan flushing attachments are not required as they are considered uh, anti-ligature safety issues. Um, this has already been removed from patient rooms and it was just removing them from the airborne isolation rooms. And I notice you, I'm showing the wand here uh, versus the one on the toilet. Um, different reasons for that is that the toilet mount one can conflict with accessible rooms, but the one with the hose can actually be removed from the wall. Um, just changing some of the language from unit to service space for psychiatric facilities. Um, and also noting that a pediatric and adolescent activity space may be centralized for common use by multiple pediatric and adolescent units um, or may be in individual units. The uh, patient risk assessment, safety risk assessment that you do as part of the functional program will identify the different risks and if they can be shared. Um, this is a scheduling thing and not a building code thing, but they, we can provide areas of act for activity that can be shared between the different populations, but not at the same time. And they cannot uh, traverse any adult patient populations when they're traveling. All right, Th thanks Richard for that. That's a lot of good information. Uh, I wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone that if you have a project specific question, please go ahead and send it to the Regs unit at oshpod.ca.gov email. That's R E G S U N I T at O S H P D dot C A dot G O V. So, next for a presenter, we have Mr. Roy Lobo, uh, Principal Structural Engineer. Roy, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, if you don't mind, help you with the transitioning of the slides here. So, uh, please let me know when you're ready to advance the slides. Roy? Okay, thank you, Cesar, and thanks everyone for um, listening to this webinar on structural changes to the part two, volume two of the 2019 mid cycle. So, uh, what we have here are basically changes in the structural chapters. Uh, so, this is only limited changes. So, we have changes to chapter 16, 16A. Uh, those are related to anchorage and bracing of equipment. Uh, in chapter 17, we have some changes for special inspection for architectural components related to periodic inspections, and then uh, changes related to special seismic certifications. Chapter 18, soils and foundations, we have changes, basically a very small, very minor change uh, to coordinate with changes that were initiated by DSA. Uh, masonry, these were changes that we made when we uh, when we made the Oshpod 1R categories and we transferred uh, 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 um, the requirements from the A chapters for Oshpod 2 and Oshpod 5 to the to model code. So when we did that, we transferred our amendments from the A chapters to the non-A chapters for uh, chapter 21. And with that, we uh, initiated a number of uh, public comments uh, related to masonry. So so we basically cleaned up the language to uh, to address those public comments. Uh, chapters 22 and 22A are related to steel. This is where we adopted the uh, AISC 358, uh, Supplement 1, Chapter 11, that is to include the use of bolted side plate connections. And, chap and Appendix L, Earthquake Recording Instrumentation, this is required to maintenance of that and who pays for that. Uh, next slide, Caesar. Okay, so uh, coming down to each specific um, code change, you know, I'll, I'll go through them fairly quickly. So in, in this section, basically, it's related to the component importance factors. So when we when we made the change, uh, uh, we made a change It's uh, for... Uh, uh, I, I sub P equals 1.5 for certain components in the non A chapter, so model code. And in that, uh, the way it was originally written was a little bit uh, overbroad. 
and it says medical and electrical components and components required for life support for patients. So, so then we clarify the language that is only that ISAP is equal to 1.5. These are these are the requirements in the in the model code requirements. We didn't want everything to have an ISAP of 1.5, and then that also brings with it uh, maybe requirements for special seismic certification. So we eliminated that. We clarify the language there. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah. So uh, in order to do that, uh, so this is really related to the uh, uh, exemptions and exceptions for uh, equipment. So the um, so 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 what what happens here is that section sixteen seventeen a point one point eighteen uh, modified requirements uh, of sec of AAC seven section thirteen point. 1.4, which is exceptions to anchorage and bracing of non-structural components. Uh, so since we had our own definitions, initially we were co-aligned with DSA. So uh, we made our own section. Next slide. So this is these are the uh, changes that were made. Uh, uh, Richard already talked about all the definitions for uh, fixed, movable, mobile equipment, etc. So, so what what we have in this particular section is given the definition. So, once you classify your equipment into which category it's going to be, then the specific requirement for anchorage and bracing will be is given in this particular section. So, the the reason why we did this was because the original way in which it was written was. We had exceptions from anchorage and bracing, then we had exemptions to the exceptions, and it was getting a little bit confusing. So we decided to write it more in the affirmative, like these equipment will be anchored and braced. So you start with fixed, then you move on to, is, is it fixed? No, you move on to movable, mobile, et cetera. And then you can see whether you had to be anchored and braced and what and what the requirements for. And if you want to have more information on that, on, on that, uh, uh, there is a pin 68 that you can refer to, and I think Richard also uh, mentioned about that as well. Uh, next slide. So if you look at uh, pin 68, there's a nice graphics there that uh, once you classify your equipment into whether it's going to be fixed, it's going to be countertop or it's other, then you look at what the weight of that equipment is and where the CG is. And then based on that, you will know whether you have to anchor it, whether it's exempt, or whether uh, you have to anchor it and, sub and give us calculations or you don't have to give us calculations. So, so for example, if you look at the, the top figure um, on, on the left, it says fixed or movable equipment. So then it says, then if your uh, equipment is, below four feet, if the center of gravity of that equipment is below four feet, then you only need to anchor and brace that equipment. If it, the center of gravity of the equipment is above uh, four feet, and, sorry, and weight is less than 400 pounds, right? And then if, if your uh, weight is less than 400 pounds and your center of mass is above four feet, then you need to also provide supporting calculation. So like that, you can move through each of those figures depending on once you decide what class of what classification your equipment is, uh, you will need to know, then you will know to know whether it's exempt or whether it's to be anchored and what are the requirements for that. So I uh, recommend everybody look at pin 68 if you're not clear on what needs to be anchored and braced. Next. Yeah, so this was kind of a cleanup. Uh, for the provisions for uh, piping and tubing systems. So uh, this was an exception uh, that that we have for a distributed system that are sitting on a trapeze. So the way that if you have from, uh, from, from bracing those uh, trapezes, if the trapeze assembly and whatever distribution system is sitting on that has uh, certain limitations on rod size, diameter, et cetera, and then these are all exceptions in the A chapters. And then it says, do not support IP with an, uh, with a piping with an ISRP greater than 1.0. So 
since it's already a chapter, your ISA P was already 1.5, and this ISA P greater than 1.0 was causing kind of a confusion, and that was not the intent. So, so we deleted that uh, that's that that uh, sentence there or that those, those statements there. So that we said, uh, uh, do not support uh, piping with ISA P greater than one. We deleted that so that we, we avoid any confusion in how you adopt the exemption from piping and bracing when you have certain criteria that is met. Uh, next. So this is the uh, change that we made for architectural components, which says periodic inspection is required. Uh, so we said that, and then you know, and then w w with that, uh, it it also brought in requirements for uh, verified reports and uh, special inspectors required. And uh, we said for some of these things, you know, we have continuous inspection. So we said if you already have continuous inspection with an IOR performing that duty, then you don't need to have a periodic special inspection done on top of that, right? So. If if that work is already being performed by uh, IOR doing continuous inspection, why do we need uh, another periodic special inspector to do that same same work? So we we said an exception to that. We said it's it's not required if it is uh, performed. The work is performed in in accordance with Section Seven One Forty Five of the California Administrative Code. So we just cleaned up the language there. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and this change was regarding special seismic certification for fluoroscopy, X-ray, and CT equipment, and then also a change for servers and routers. So um, go to the next slide. So, so what happened here was uh, there was a comment by MITA so, uh, which said that uh, you have an exception for CT on the under item eight is struck out here. You have an exception for CT. So CT equipment used for treatment in hybrid uh, operating rooms, including those for interventional CT, unless used for diagnostic assessment of trauma injuries. But you do not have the same exception for fluoroscopy and X-ray equipment, and they are all you know to do the same thing for treatment of trauma injuries. And they said that so it looks like only CT is exempt but uh, if it is put in one of these rooms and, and, and for those purposes, but that exemption is not applied for fluoroscopy and X-ray equipment. So, uh, so then we had a discussion on that and then we decided that, you know, we're going to say it's going to be imaging equipment, which is fluoroscopy, CT, X-ray. So, so which is required for emergency treatment of trauma prey patients, you know, shall be special seismic certified. So those are equipment that needs to be uh, tested on a shake table test. And they said, but we can want to limit the number of those that are required. So if, for example, you are a trauma facility and you need a number of these equipment, then you need to certify all of those. That is going to basically treat people uh, that are going to be coming in for trauma in an, in an emergency, especially like an earthquake. So if you want, we want to make sure all of those are special seismic certified and then uh, it also says a minimum someone, so so uh, minimum of one. So basically, the hospital gets to decide which of those uh, imaging equipment used for trauma for treatment of trauma injuries is required to be functional after an event. So, so so that's the thing. But we said a minimum of one of those has to be there. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and then the the other change for uh, special seismic certification was made for um, uh, servers and routers and also switches, because now a lot of the hospital functions are now being controlled by computers. You know, your doors, your lights, operating tables. A lot of these are computer controlled, and these are dependent on your servers, routers, and thing medic medical data, etc. And a lot of equipment stored. So if any of those go down, you cannot, you may not be able to perform uh, the function that you're expected to perform. And so uh, we need to be fully functional uh, in the uh, uh, event of an earthquake. So we said that all those uh, servers, routers, and switches that 
are required for the continued operation of the facility need to be uh, shake table tested. Now, we made some also modifications to that. We said uh, some of these are already shake table tested as part of the uh, quality control. So, so, the, so the vendor says, you know what, these servers, routers, et cetera, are so critical. They have a lot of tests going on for those. He said, uh, we, will, we will permit those without doing additional shake table testing if the seismic test for those particular servers, routers, and switches conformed uh, you know, were, were at a level that uh, uh, where you're going to install it, you know, that uh, exceeded that uh, acceleration demand and, and it still was functional, then we will not require additional uh, shake table testing for those. So, so we made uh, changes there. And then, we, and then uh, with the introduction of the new equipment categories, we also introduced terms like temporary and in, uh, interim. So we said those equipment, also, uh, even though they were, may have typically required uh, special seismic certification, now do not require special seismic certification. So we clarified that. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so PR and curtain wall foundations, uh, uh, currently they were just reserved and now uh, DSA said we want to say not permitted, so Oshport said fine. Next. Yeah, so these are uh, amendments that I, I, I spoke about earlier in the masonry chapter. These were to align with, um, were basically in response to uh, public comments made for the uh, 2018 uh, triennial code cycle change that we made. So, uh, so we got public comments from there and one of the agreements was that uh, we will make those changes in the mid-cycle. So uh, I'll just walk you quickly through each of those changes. Next slide. So yeah, so the, the first change was in section 2103.5A, entrainment. So we had initially the language said A, uh, entraining substances. So uh, the comment was uh, that's, that's vague. There's no term like substances. So we changed it to materials or uh, and training admixtures. Next, very, very non, very minor changes. Next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, the next one was on uh, section twenty one uh, four point two point one. This was related to grout pores. So instead of specifying what needs to be done, we just uh, uh, referred to the TMS section that. Uh, basically has similar language to for the for that same purpose and then uh, there was another statement which said the construction document shall completely describe the grouting procedure subject to approval by Oshport. and then the public comment when that is kind of un, uh, unenforceable so we decided, we agreed with that and we deleted that uh, that statement from the the language next Yeah, uh, so this is section 2105.2, compressive strength. So we said uh, specified uh, compressive strength F prime M assumed in, uh, in design. So they did not like the word assumed, right? And so typically right now, if you build something with masonry, the minimum compressive strength is around 200 P uh, 2000 PSI. So we said, that, so since that's the case, we said the minimum compressive, uh, uh, specified compressive strength uh, in the design shall be 2000 PSI. So we just uh, uh, clarify the language to remove the word assumed from, from the existing language. And then the, there was an exception subject to approval of the, of the enforcement agencies. So uh, we felt uh, that's not appropriate language because then, uh, you know, that gives too much uh, leeway to the enforcement agency to decide, oh, we're not going to accept this or we, we're going to accept this. So this is related to higher F prime M. So we said we we, we deleted that uh, uh, that sentence there, that uh, those 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 words, and we said higher uh, values of F prime M may be used in the design of reinforced grouted masonry. We removed the approval by uh, the enforcement agencies, and then there was another uh, sentence we removed was uh, related to the 
strength and stiffness the design shall uh, take into account motor motor depth so those also we felt were unenforceable and cannot be uh, calculated so we remove that language as well next uh, again in this section uh, there was a reference to tms 402 section 4.4.4.2.2 which uh, was pointed out was an inappropriate uh, uh, reference, so we deleted that. Next. Uh, yeah, so this is the minimum reinforcement for masonry columns. So, uh, and then it says the spacing of column ties shall not be greater than eight bar diameters, uh, 28 tie diameters, or one half the dimension of the columns or the full height of the column. And the comment was that uh, there is a limit on the maximum spacing of ties to eight inches and column dimensions can be such that you can exceed that eight inches and that will be incompatible with what the code requirements are. So we said, okay, we will say all eight inches and we we'll remove the 28 die, uh, tie diameter requirement from there because it's already uh, three eighth inch. So it was redundant, so next. Yeah, and this was related to maximum uh, bar size, uh, 2107.4. So uh, initially we had your bar size cannot uh, be greater than number nine. And then uh, there was a comment about that because there is now actually a conflict between uh, what uh, the allowable uh, stress design section of TMS says and the strength design section of what TMS says. The strength design still limits your maximum bar size for, uh, for, for I'm talking about uh, uh, the 2016 code, uh, uh, TMS 2016, uh, but, um, it, it, but so, so we just said we'll reference the appropriate section of TMS 404, uh, 9.3.3.1, which limits the bar size to number nine. Uh, that of course is going to be changing in the upcoming uh, code, but uh, Oshpot still intends to keep uh, this minimum requirement uh, of maximum bar diameter or uh, limited to number nine uh, for future. So, so that may change back to, uh, to our requirement in, in a future code cycle. And then uh, section 2107.6, uh, it says uh, masonry components that are subject to in-plane forces. So, so, the, so the public comment, comment was, uh, oh, this is this is uh, this is not uh, clear what components mean. So then we clarified uh, what those are and and what that uh, specific uh, code section referred to in terms of the requirements for that section. Okay, next. Okay, and then. Uh, we're moving on to steel, uh, chapter 22 and chapter 22A. Uh, we had a lot of conversations with site plate and uh, we also approved uh, some of their design criteria and then we were starting to find a lot of uh, alternate method of compliance for uh, use of bolted connections for site plate bolted connections, which was currently not there in the, in the building code. And so, but it was already there, that language for uh, which, which was approved by the uh, IIC uh, 358.16 in Supplement 1, uh, Chapter 11, was already approved by the uh, PRP uh, for, for this connection. And, and so we said, okay, we've gone through the design criteria for this, we made amendments, we are using it on certain projects. So we said, okay, we will include this particular uh, connection. It's a pre-qualified Bowman connection uh, for use for Oshpot products, uh, um, projects, provided that uh, they follow our design criteria. So we came up with some uh, limitations on, on the use of that. And then we had discussions with side plate uh, and then we came to an agreement that uh, everyone is comfortable that for Oshpot projects, they were permitted to use these bolted connections. 
uh, as opposed to the welded connections uh, and uh, uh, given that uh, people follow those additional requirements in the design criteria. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So this is basically the hysteric loop. The, the figures on the left show the hysteric loop for a welded connection. The figures on the right show them for a bolted. So uh, while the bolted can show that it can do uh, plastic deformations, you know, exceeding that of a welded connection, uh, if you can see there's some slip at, at some midway uh, in the demand, in the moment the capacity, you know, it, it slips and then picks up strength. Uh, after that, to to reach its full uh, uh, moment capacity of the of the beam, so uh, so that's how they're able to get like further uh, out on the on the uh, plastic rotation curve. However, when it comes to uh, things like wind, you know, we want to be within a certain range. So we said, okay, for for uh, events that do not push are supposed to be elastic they do not push your deformation into the inelastic range or for a required r factor then for those cases we will limit your your uh, mp to a fraction of what your uh, moment capacity per beam is for wind design but for earthquakes we will permit you your full so so looking at all those we came up with the design criteria can you go to the next slide so, so we 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 came up with some design criteria for that. Uh, so these are the requirements that if you want to use the bolted side plate connection, it is advantageous to use this compared to the welded side plate connection because it saves a lot of it's cheaper, I think, and it saves a lot of um, inspection requirements and welding uh, because the welding for those side plate connections was um, was causing a lot of problems. Uh, there's a lot of inspection to be done, and it's pretty expensive. And it and uh, something goes wrong, you know that, that that to redo those and make and 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 fix those well problems was an issue. So um, so uh, so the side plate is is now trying to have a combination of welded in the shop and then field bolted uh, in the field. So it's, it's so the setup is a lot easier, and it's a lot faster and easier to to construct. So next slide. So this is regarding uh, maintenance for um, uh, buildings that require seismic instrumentation. So there are two types of seismic instrumentation that is required. So there's a, one is Oshport paid uh, instrumentation for buildings and one is owner paid. So if depending on your building, if it is requires an AMC, an alternate method of, of uh, compliance for your uh, uh, structural lateral force system, then you are required to uh, instrument the building. So if it is required instrumentation for that specific lateral force resisting system for that particular hospital building, then then uh, the original language was said uh, that uh, Oshport picks up the maintenance tab for that. So we said, no, well, we are only going to pick up the data retrieval an instrument and processing of and records will be the uh, responsibility enforcing the agencies. The uh, if, if something goes wrong with the instrumentation or the the seismic um, accelerometer or the recorder, then then that uh, will be the responsibility of the owner. So then uh, why we we will contract this with CSMIP. So then we will be sending the owner a, a bill for that. So we will let them know it's hey this instrumentation is not working. And then you, you, they need to fix it. So either they fix it or they can have CSMIP uh, fix it for them, and then uh, they will get billed for that. OK. Um, OK, I'm done. Uh, Great, thank you. Thank you, Roy, for that. That's a lot of good information. Again, we want to thank everybody who, who has taken the time to type in a question into the go to question box. So we'll go ahead and go over those um, here. Um, in just a minute, but I also want to remind you that you can have a uh, an answer to a specific project related question by emailing us at that email that we shared with you before. 
which is regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. So Richard and Roy, uh, now we're getting into the question and answer portion of our presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and read out these uh, questions. So if you uh, can, uh, please uh, provide uh, an answer to those. So Richard, this first question is for you. Um, does maintenance include replacing a motor if it dies? Yeah, if, they, uh, if it's a subcomponent, um, yes, you can replace a motor. That's not a big deal. They, they have to be replaced in kind. Um, it's when they replace the entire unit that they would need to notify us and do a equipment replacement project. So replacing a motor or a fan or something like that on a piece of equipment is definitely maintenance. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for you as well, Richard. The question reads, can you describe an example of major scope change? Uh, no, I cannot. Um, there's too many variables. Um, what we're looking at avoiding here is when you say design an emergency department and you have everything laid out, it gets reviewed. Uh, it's maybe first, second, third back check and it comes back in and they revise the whole thing. We're basically what we're, if we have to go back and do our review over, that's what we're trying to trigger this um, requirement for. Because the reality is that even if it happens now, the way the code's currently written, it's supposed to be canceled and resubmitted as a new project. Um, but we don't do that. It actually, typically we eat the cost and re-review it. And as well as the same thing with the ACDs. If a major change comes in, Typically, we redo it or we get permission from the owner to do his time and materials. Um, what we're trying to avoid is the re-review of the project. If you're doing a change, no problem. But if you're saying, okay, we're going to take this space, disregard everything that we've done, and now here's our new design that goes in there, um, that would what I would consider a major change. But as far as defining that, as far as cost or space, that can't be done. It's going to be a case by case basis, and and you know, and if there's justification for it, true justification rather than someone changed their mind, you may be fine. Great, thank you, Richard. And this this next question, I believe you, you sort of answered it already, but I'll read it off anyways in case you'd like to add anything to your response. The question reads. Section 7-153, changes to approve work, major changes is not referenced in the code language. What, if, what extent of change, quote unquote, requires a new project application? Would it be helpful to describe the extent of change? Yeah, it's like, like same, same thing. It's just impossible to, to trigger that um, with a definition because you can have a small project that you come in and, and revise the whole thing, even though the quantity may be small. But there, again, the review has been done, the process, the effort has been exerted to complete that. And it comes back in and we've got to start from scratch. Again, a small project, it may not that, be that big, but now you have a big project. Again, how do you define what would be considered a, a major change? Um, typically what I've been seeing is they will go back to the design team and the owner and say, to make this change, we want to uh, submit it as an examination, which is time and materials. And if the owner says fine, we proceed accordingly. But it's usually something pretty substantial that would trigger that. If uh, Richard, this one's for you as well. And it kind of a project specific question, but we'll, we'll ask it, uh, it might help others. Um, I currently have a network cable installation that is close to completion and the hospital is planning to add wireless access points throughout the campus to augment the network. Would the wireless AP network scope addition to the network cable install be reviewed and inspected on TNM basis or would it have to be a separate project? That's a good question because we see a lot of this. The intent of these projects when they come in to do a network or even run conduit as a project, the intent is to come in with another project to address the specific components that are being attached to that network. So that would be a separate project. Um, if they went in and wanted to do a ACD to add the, the other components, again, that's going to be up to uh, the design um, the design review team, or the re review team, I should say, to make that clear, um, if they would consider that as an ACD. 
But most of these projects that we see come in this way, the intent is just to get the infrastructure installed, and then they come in later with another project to add the components. We see that quite often. It's never really been an issue, and we've never, that I know of, had them add the components midstream and say, okay, now we want to add these. Um, Because that can easily be done as a separate project simultaneously with the review and not affect the current review. That's how I would address it. That's great. And we hope that that helps, uh, uh, Dan. Richard, for you, uh, next question is uh, regarding C-ARM. Um, is a C-ARM considered mobile equipment? <laughs> Depends. Is it anchored to the ceiling? Um, <laughs> some C-ARMs are considered, would be considered mobile. Depends if it falls under the definition of mobile or movable. Um, that's what we'd be looking at. You do have some C-ARMs that you can move around from room to room. That would be truly mobile. If it's in the one imaging room and is positioned in a the same position every day for use and is on occasion moved out for cleaning, that would be movable. All right, uh, thank you for that, Richard. Um, as it as it relates to essential equipment, um, the the, uh, the person asking the question says, "Please confirm essential equipment, quote unquote, is its own definition. Doesn't matter if it's countertop." fixed, interim, mobile, movable, or uh, other temporary. Only non-essential equipment should be uh, designated as countertop, movable, et cetera, right? Well, essential is going to be anchored, period. And that's where it comes in. Um, and Roy, you can add to this if you want. Um, but essential is identified by the owner during the plan design as an essential equipment. The essential equipment also considers anything required for basic services. Um, so that's what, I mean, there's been a ton of discussion on the definition of essential and, and it's gone round and round and it's settled on this. Um, basically the owner identifies it during the design phase of, of the, and it would need to be anchored. If it's needed in a case of an emergency, if it's going to be used, if there's an event, it's considered essential and should be anchored. And yes, it can fall across all the different categories of fixed, movable, uh, countertop. Roy, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I think I think there may be a weight uh, limit on that. You know, I mean, it 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 may be anchored above a certain weight and CG or something. It may have some 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 uh, exceptions, but uh, generally, you're right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would rec really recommend you guys watch the uh, Pin 68. It's really, it's an hour of just this equipment anchorage stuff. It's, it's actually, uh, Ali Sumer did it. It's very good. It answers a lot of questions. We do we do get a lot of questions on this whenever we discuss it. Great, thank you. Thank you both, Roy and, and Richard. Uh, next question, Richard, I believe this one is for you. Um, the question reads, in the area of a bay needs to be within the cubicle curtain, how do we handle the space between bays where three foot clear is required to the side of the gurney or five foot between gurneys? Does this new uh, definition require a minimum of six feet now between gurneys or would the curtain be two, two and a half feet from the gurneys? No, um, the, the three foot, if it says three feet between beds, that's your requirement. If it says five feet between beds, that's your requirement. Um, that would put the cubicle curtain at uh, 18 inches or even at two and a half feet. Um, and what the, the language says, it does not overlap with the access circulation aisle. So that's kind of, it's really not between the beds they're concerned about, but more at the foot of the bed and the access circulation is not obstructed. Um, that does come up a lot, and we are re-looking at this to make sure it is clear. But um, even from an accessibility standpoint, you have three feet clear at the side of the bed, but the cubicle curtain can still be two and a half feet because it is a non-fixed obstruction. So that's a good question, and like I said, we continue to look at this language on that. Uh, they have considered going to six feet but that would really throw off a lot of projects, especially in the future when people do redesign. Um, as it relates to definitions, um, quote, hand washing station, 
Um, unless hands-free operation is provided, should uh, it be clarified to hands-free operation of door, quote unquote, rather than hands-free operation of associated hand washing station component? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, yes, you're correct. Um, and it does, it is very confusing. I went back and read it. And I think adding the hands-free operation of the door is what's intended and will be clarified in the future. Basically, what it says is hand washing stations shall be immediately accessible to the patient care area they serve without requiring passage through a doorway unless hands free operation is provided. It's hand free operation of the door is provided. So you don't you're not touching a doorknob or pushing on a door. That's that's what's important there. So that's a good catch. That's great. Uh, how are the uh, infection control issues of a drain in a room used for open invasive procedures dealt with? I'm assuming this is referring to the hand washing sink and the trauma room that can be used as a OR. And ORs are not allowed to have sinks. Um, we have met with CDPH and we have consulted with others to get this definition. And that's where the five foot around the table came in as a requirement, as a minimum requirement. Um, the answer we got was that these rooms are typically used more for the trauma patient, not necessarily as an OR, and on the rare occasion they are used as an OR, that this would be acceptable. So that's the best answer I can give you. But we did, we did uh, run this through CDPH. Great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard, regarding clinics, do the section one twelve twenty four requirements that are applicable to hosp out hospital outpatient services also ap applicable to OSHPOT three clinics that are not hospital outpatient services, such as community clinics, etc. Uh, only if the OSHPOT three requirements point them back to twelve twenty four. Otherwise, they have their own requirements in twelve twenty six. Um, we did. We we are adding some language in the the next cycle to help clarify that. And basically it says if, um, I believe it says that in here as to if they are repeated, you go with the section they belong to. Otherwise they point back to 1224 or 1228 um, and they should be treated as such. Where we're, where we're seeing big differences in it, like a dialysis, um, we, those are specific to the types of clinics or the inpatient or outpatient of a hospital requirements. So they, they do specify when they point back and when they do not. If they don't, they usually have their own requirements within 1226, and that's for the OSHPOD 3. I don't know if I just confused that or if it helped. Well, and if, if those have uh, more questions on, on that specific topic, please uh, email us at that at regsunit at oshpod.ca.gov. Uh, Roy, this next question I believe is for you. Do the PIN 68 criteria for under four feet, no calcs, apply to wall supported equipment? Uh, no. Uh, th that is, that we're going to make that change in the, in the next uh, cycle. So we're going to clarify that, that requirement. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Wall, wall is still 20 pounds anywhere on the wall. It has nothing to do with height. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. For seismic certification for routers and switches, is there an exception if their weight weights are below a certain amount? These are typically very light without much load. Um, it, see, the thing is, these are put in racks and things, and generally, uh, you know, we do not have an exception for those. So, uh, they may need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but, uh, but they're typically not, not, there's no exception. We have exception for under 50 pounds, but those are surface-mounted. Uh, these are in racks. Uh, it's not exactly surface-mounted, and, you know, typically they need to be shaped table test with the rack. However, we've given some exceptions, like, okay, if your rack is strong enough, robust enough, then only the uh, server or router or switch needs to be shake table tested. But currently, there is no exception on weight for those. But, but we did clarify if it is affecting the operation of the hospital. So if we can show 
that it's not or you have a redundant system or whatever you know we may look into that and and and, uh, uh, and decide on whether it needs seismic certification or not all right and in terms of roof equipment uh if Oshpod has approved the design in, in this individual's case for screening mechanical equipment does the city or county need to approve also uh, we are a county facility if it's a new roof screen the city or the local jurisdiction would have to approve that basically if it's aesthetic they'd have to approve it now if it's replacing an existing one they don't necessarily have to but if they're adding something new, like a new HVAC unit, and they're putting a roof screen around it, that we would ask for local approval um, of that, and it's usually at the uh, planning level. That's great. Um, next question is, um, and Roy, this question might be for you. Does the inspector have to go to the factory to review the side plate welding portion, or is this routinely done by Oshpod staff? No, there is a, there's a special welding inspector. He needs to have the proper qualifications uh, to do that welding inspection. And he's going to be the one doing that. Uh, we only do observation. We, don't, we do not do inspection. Perfect. Uh, and the next question uh, is has to do with scheduling and uh, invoices. So the question reads, please clarify how, who schedules the maintenance of seismic instrumentation is it Oshpod and then they send invoice to owner or is it the owner supposed to schedule it? Uh, that That's a new requirement. So far, we've not had anyone uh, um, you know, uh, uh, have the owner schedule it and things like that. Uh, that's still in process. But what happens is if the uh, CSMIP tells us that, hey, this particular hospital, this instrumentation is not working, then we will contact the owner and say, hey, listen, your equipment is not working. This is an uh, um, uh, uh, hospital owner required instru uh, instrumented building. Therefore, uh, we have two options. One of them, you can fix it yourself. Uh, once it's ready, then you can contact CSMIP to make sure that the, uh, the data transmission is coming correctly. And uh, or you can have CSMIP go ahead and, and fix it, and then we will invoice you. So, so that's how that's going to work. Thank you, Roy. Uh, Richard, this question might be for you. Uh, the, the question reads, would changes to phasing in a project be considered major change? When is a determination to review as examination slash TMM determined? Well, my first answer was going to be no. Um, but we, I've literally seen a project come in that was a change to phasing, which completely redesigned the entire mechanical system for the department. In that case, it would be, yes, that would be a major change. Um, if you're just changing, like, the sequence, things like that, because with mechanic, mechanical is a big deal when it comes to phasing, because a lot of times you have to provide complete uh, mechanical systems to the spaces that are being already being serviced. And so it, it is going to be the same answer as before. It's going to be a case by case basis. Once can we look at it? What is the extent of the change, both in phasing and how does it affect the design? Um, again, most of the projects we get in here, the most of the changes that we see during review do not go to this level. But there are some that we've had serious meetings over the amount of changes that are being done. Um, either mid-review or as an ACD to a project. And if the owner is insisting on these changes be made, a lot of times they're okay with uh, doing a TNM review for that. And really the TNM is an option to keep it in the project and keep the process going versus re you know, submitting a separate project or a separate component of the work. Um, so it's really... It, it is designed to help the pro process move faster, but also have Oshawa get compensa compensated for uh, re re uh, what's it, duplication of their, their work, their effort. Great. Um, thank, thank you, Richard. That's a lot of good information. And we hope that you uh, all in attendance are catching all this and taking notes. If, if not, uh, please send us a follow-up email. Uh, next question is, uh, why are there different requirements for different imaging modalities? What regs apply to, quote, combination equipment such as a PTCT? 
In re- what regard are they asking, like for Anchorage or for installation, for clearances? Um, yeah, that's a very, very general question. So, uh, yeah. Robin, if you, uh, if you, if you're there and you're still here in attendance, please uh, send up a follow, send a follow up, uh, follow up or clarification in the GoTo panel for that question. If you're there, yeah. if not, email us. Yeah, as a general, like a PET CT would fall under your nuclear med type situation, whereas a standard PT CT would not. So there's there's a lot of variables to that question that it would be hard to answer generically. Great. And uh, maybe the next question, uh, Richard, is for you. Uh, The question is, is a PIXIS unit essential? If there is not an alternate method to receive the meds, yes. If power goes out and the PIXIS goes down, there has to be a way to get meds. That's why a PIXIS needs to be on a critical branch. Um, So, yes, for anchoring, they, they are required to be anchored. They are considered movable. Uh, next question is, would a nourishment refrigerator be considered essential? Not necessarily. It depends if the owner classifies it as such. Great. Um, yeah, and it may also depend on where it is, what department it's in. If it's a basic service department, like a med surgery unit, it might. Whereas in an ICU, that's optional. It may not be. But um, when uh, it also would depend on the size. There's a lot of factors that go goes into that. For this next question, Richard, um, and it has to do with uh, part of the code that was uh, clarified uh, dealing with CT full view, quote unquote, uh, in a control room. So the, the question reads, for CT full view from control room could still be interpreted as looking at the full body like down the barrel. Does this mean you can have a partial direct view from control room and a full view via camera? The, uh, no. Um, basically, full view means you need to see the patient if there's any distress. If anything is going wrong, you have to be able to see if that patient is in any danger. Um, it does not mean down the barrel. An MRI does require a view down the barrel. Now, with a hybrid operating room where you have imaging uh, modalities in there as well as an operating room and the rooms are very long we are using allowing the use of a camera to monitor the patient status but that's the only location the camera can be used but otherwise like a ct you just want to even a side view of the patient just to know if something's wrong um, a lot of those do have cameras on them but that is in, in addition to the uh, physical uh, site of the patient but they have right. monitor, they have cameras built into the, the the bores where they can monitor the patient that way. But that's not in lieu of being able to see the patient. This next uh, question is a follow up to the Pixis uh, question that you answered earlier, Richard. Um, the the question is a, says how about a half Pixis which sits on a countertop which is two foot high, and that the the original question was. Is a PIXIS unit essential? It's still the same answer. It's still essential. It's still required to give drugs to the patient, the meds to the patient. Great. So you would and use uh, Ross- 68 to determine the type of anchorage that would be required or how it's presented. But yes. Great. And uh, Robin was able to follow up on the uh, clarification of, of the question. The, the original question is, why are there different requirements for different imaging modalities uh, to what regs apply to combination equipment such as uh, a PET-CT? And Robin uh, wrote back and said, Anchorage is clear in terms of emergency use. And then also provided, well, what about clearances that apply to CTs? Would those apply to MRIs or uh, PET-CTs? Uh, the clearances, they have their own requirements. CTs, MRIs, they all have their own requirements. As far as the use of the equipment, Roy, you can answer that as far as the differences if you want, or I can give it a shot for shot. emergency use. Basic, basically, what we're doing, we're pro- right now, if the code requires a fluoroscopy room to be provided. That's because Title 22 requires it. So you have to have a fluoroscopy room. 
currently that fluoroscopy room is your essential go-to modality for imaging in a case of an event. What we're allowing, and Roy, correct me if I'm wrong, but if what we're allowing is you the facility to choose what modality, is it CT, is it the fluoroscopy unit, is it the MRI, whatever it might be, the, the, I don't think it's MRI, it's X-ray, fluoroscopy, or CT, they can pick which of those are used in the event of an emergency, and that piece of equipment would be the one that has to be seismically certified. Is that correct, Roy? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. And then really the restriction we're getting is Title 22 hasn't been updated in quite a while. It's currently they're redoing the imaging department right now, but uh, the requirement for, for fluoroscopy has always been there and still there. Um, but it doesn't mean that has to be what's used in the case of an, an event. So we're allowing that to change, but that piece of equipment that's selected to be used and I found more facilities are going with the CT scanner uh, to be used in the event, that would have to be the seismically certified component. Correct. And that's why there's a difference. It right, doesn't get into, you. Yeah, PET CT and doesn't get into that. Those are different uses. You're limited to CT, X-ray, and fluoroscopy. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Roy, for answering all the questions that came in. <clears throat> we are not seeing any more questions come in in the GoTo panel, so we want to take this opportunity to thank you uh, for participating in this presentation, uh, both you, Richard, and Roy. And for those who signed up uh, to attend this part one, we also want to thank you for your interest and want to remind you that uh, on February 9th, we, are, we have part two of this uh, 2019 CBSC or California Building Standards Code Intervening Code Cycle Updates. Uh, part two is going to cover the California Electrical Code, the California Mechanical Code, the California Plumbing Code, and the California Existing Code. So if you have uh, time, please uh, make time or participate and join us for this, for this uh, presentation. And if you know someone who might benefit from this information, feel free to pass the word along, have them join us as well. We want to go ahead and thank you for joining us today. So until next time, thank you for, for being here and thank you for doing your part in providing access to safe, quality healthcare environments. Until next time.